But joining us now is James Clapper. He served as the director of national intelligence for seven years under President Obama and is now a CNN national security analyst. Dr. Uh, director Clapper, it is so good to have you here during this breaking news because Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, some of their most active years were 2010 through 2017 when you were director of national intelligence. What do you think as you watch the arrest today at the behest of the United States? Well, I was, uh, of course, recalling uh, uh, the 2010 uh, era was, was right as I had started as uh, DNI and had, and had to deal with uh, uh, the impact of the Chelsea Manning revelations, uh, which were quite, uh, quite damaging and, uh, and it caused us all kinds of grief in the, in, in the intelligence community. I do think that um, Jeffrey Tubin, uh, I think, as always, uh, articulated uh, the complexities of this case. And there is the uh, you know, freedom of the press aspect. I personally, and this is a, a legal, a personal opinion, not a legal opinion, think I'm in the, my Pompeo school that WikiLeaks is really a non-nation state um, hostile intelligence service. But that, I'm saying that as an intel guy mm -hmm. and having lived through uh, the grief that uh, those revelations caused. There is the comparison between uh, WikiLeaks and the likes of, say, the New York Times or the Washington Post. That's what WikiLeaks is making. I mean, they well, they want to make that comparison. I I, I recognize that. I I will just point out uh, one subtle difference uh, from a practical standpoint is that when the New York Times, the likes of the New York Times or uh, uh, the Washington Post or any of the responsible media. Uh, came into possession of a classified material, uh, typically, not always, but, but typically, they would at least give us, the intelligence community, the opportunity to comment and make the case for not public, uh, publishing something. Now, uh, I will say also, that, though, that their definition of what uh, is harmful to national security and my definition of what's harmful yes. to national security what, were not exactly congruent. Look, these but are the conversations. Is, the important difference here, yeah. uh, Allison, is that at least we had the opportunity to make our case. And if someone's life was potentially at risk, responsible media would not publish that. Yes, these are conversation, hard conversations that are had in newsrooms around the country and the world all the time. But I'm curious, obviously all of us are curious to see what, when this is unsealed and we expect it to happen moments from now, what the charges are against Julian Assange. And it sounds like, if you believe his editor, we spoke to the WikiLeaks editor uh, a few minutes ago, that it's about the 2010 publication and revelations, that it's not about 2016. But of course, right. so much has changed since 2010 here in this country. And you will remember that President Trump said, I love WikiLeaks. He encouraged WikiLeaks. He hoped that WikiLeaks would publish more of the, from the DNC hack. He was quite sympathetic to WikiLeaks and a fan of WikiLeaks. And so what does that mean now for the court case back here at home now that President Trump is, is sympathetic to them? Well, you're right to point out what's changed since 2010, and uh, I don't know. And, and in fact, it it, uh, it makes the arrest at our behest apparently uh, even more curious. And obviously, uh, if if there's a a court proceeding here, undoubtedly Assange's uh, attorneys are going to point that out. That uh, uh, you know, the president of the United States, uh, as a candidate, uh, he preys on on WikiLeaks. So I. I uh, again, I, I, I'm not an attorney. I don't know how that's going to complicate uh, the, the legal case that the United States government w would now make against uh, Assange. All right. We need you on standby because obviously we are waiting for those charges to be unsealed. We believe at any moment now. And so obviously I'll go back to that when that happens. In the meantime, I wanted to ask you about what we saw yesterday from the Attorney General, Bill Barr, in front of the Senate. You called it stunning and scary, those are your words, that Barr would, raise, would use the word spying. So can you tell me what was scary about that to you? Well, spying has a, uh, a term I've never liked. I never uh, liked that term being applied to me, <clears throat> even though I spent 50 years in the, in the intelligence business. It, uh, it has a bad connotation. It's a pejorative uh, term. 
it uh, smacks of illegality, uh, lack of oversight, uh, uh, all those kind of things. And th that wasn't the case here. I, my concern in all this, as it was when I served as DNI, was the Russians and what the Russians were doing and the extent that there was surveillance of anyone, it, had, it was occasioned by contacts with Russians who were uh, targets, validated foreign intelligence targets. And we sort of lost sight of that and, and, and the threat that the Russians posed, because that's how this all started, is the Russian meddling. So when the Attorney General, and I believe he used that term deliberately, uh, you know, he's been the Attorney General before, so he's, he's, he's not unfamiliar with, with all this. Uh, I thought it was, it was quite uh, stunning. Yeah. And uh, apparently uh, he's, uh, his concern is uh, more broadly to the intelligence community at large, not, not, uh, not just the FBI. So I'm very interested in what it is that, that gives him concern. Yeah, he was unclear. Uh, he did not expound on what gave him concern. It sounded like he was open to being concerned and he was going to wait to hear what the inspector general had to say. But I want to talk about how the, what you hear Republicans saying and the president is that they should have alerted, if there was an investigation, a counterintelligence investigation that involved the Trump campaign, oh. they should have alerted the Trump campaign. Now you were the person who in January of 2017, one of the people went to tell the then president elect that all of this was swirling around and he had already been alerted that Russians were trying to interfere in the campaign. And so should the campaign have known before that date that you went over there, that there was an investigate, possibly a counterintelligence investigation involving some people connected to the campaign? Well, the, uh, I, I can't speak uh, specifically, Allison, to uh, what the FBI did. I, I believe, but I, I, I don't know for sure, but I believe they did give uh, kind of standard defensive briefings after the candidates were designated uh, after their respective conventions. Uh, when the two candidates emerged, uh, we started, as is customary, uh, uh, intelligence briefings for both candidates. But and should, the, it those, those I mean, intelligence should it have briefings gone deeper? Those intelligence briefings included uh, reporting on uh, the Russian meddling that was ongoing. Yeah. So when you hear different Republican lawmakers say, how dare they not alert the campaign that there was this counterintelligence uh, investigation, are they right or wrong? Well, I don't know what the uh, uh, decision calculus here was by the, by the FBI uh, contemporaneously. But I do know as a, as a general rule, with, with particularly with respect to a counterintelligence investigation, that when you start it, you want to be sure you're, who is potentially complicit and who isn't. And there is, uh, a, a, as a general uh, rule of thumb, you try to be as cloistered and, and uh, compartmented about uh, such investigations for all kinds of good reasons. So again, I don't know what the uh, decision calculus was at the time contemporaneously that the, the FBI used. It's my understanding they did give general uh, counterintelligence briefings specifically focused, I believe, on the Russians. Yeah, uh, it's good to get that context. Director James Clapper, keep your phone handy. We'll have you on speed dial as all of this unfolds. Thank you very much.